This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with James Grant, his latest book, The Forgotten Depression. James Grant is the founder of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He has published seven books on financial history and biography, and his journalism has been featured in Financial Times, The Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Affairs, among other publications. He has also appeared on 60 Minutes and Jim Lehrer's PBS NewsHour. Jim, glad to have you on the program. Well, thank you, Richard. Nice to be here. Well, what is uh, the Forgotten Depression uh, that you're writing about? As I, you know, I realized I didn't know too much about this. I had heard about uh, accounts of something that had happened in the early 1920s, uh, that it had been uh, you know, somewhat punishing, and, and that it had righted itself. But talk about this, this moment, this event, and kind of situate it, I, and I think it's, and you do this really well in the book, it's, it's coming at a time of, uh, of unsettlement in America, a, a lot of unsettlement, uh, the Red Scare, uh, union strikes, the famous police union strike preceded it in Boston, uh, and other things, and, uh, and also, of course, World War I has preceded it, and yet uh, here comes this um, uh, really devastating uh, economic period. Well, I, I, I became interested in the downturn of 1920-21 because, uh, as you recall, during the uh, modern Great Recession of 2007 and 8, uh, all the policymakers could talk about was the 1930s. Uh, the Great Depression uh, monopolized the market in historical analogy, and it was a convenient analogy because uh, uh, the storyline went that uh, Roosevelt intervened uh, successfully, so they said, uh, in that depression and, and saved capitalism. That was basically the storyline. Um, what happened in 1920 and 21 is an entirely different narrative. In brief, the uh, economy, uh, a word I will return to, the economy uh, stopped getting better and began getting much, much worse in the spring of 1920 and underwent a depression uh, top to bottom, about 18 months' worth, and came out of it. And the fact that uh, America came out of that depression is, in fact, the point. Uh, the point because the government really did nothing uh, to stimulate, as the word we now use, it uh, intervened hardly at all. In fact, the Federal Reserve then, still wet behind the ears, actually raised interest rates, and uh, the Congress, uh, if you can credit it, actually balanced the budget policies that a modern economist would judge to be positively medieval. Uh, yet yet uh, the uh, unassisted economy left to its own devices uh, righted itself and off went the 20s, which proverbially roared. In this regard, how do we know? I mean, what's the debate about the extent of, of this um, uh, economic downturn. Uh, well, there, you, there quote, you quote Christina Romer, an economist of some renown, as, as denying that it was a depression, something like uh, just a slip or something like that, I think she says. So what's kind of put some stats and facts behind how we can kind of understand what happened. Uh, in yes, that, in well, that this, this, the debate about the severity will never be settled statistically because the, the data then collected were, were meager, sparse. Um, uh, the very concept of the macro economy was was not yet invented, and there was no discussion about uh, government intervention. So uh, uh, the the weekly um, cascade of data we have come to expect and upon which our policymakers rely uh, simply didn't exist. Uh, data were collected afterwards, and uh, by some interpretations, those data point to a recession of of some, but not o overwhelming severity. That's Christina Romer's line. Uh, contemporary opinion was very different. Contemporary opinion uh, called this, uh, in, uh, depending on where people were, were viewing it from, people uh, regarded this as a full-blown calamity. Uh, commodity prices were down 45% or so, stock prices ditto. Um, Great Depression, certainly in the agricultural economy. Um, corporate profits collapsed, industrial production is down 30-odd uh, percent or so, top to bottom. Um, Unemployment was certainly severe, um, evidently in the double digits, um, and and an item of um, of non-statistical evidence, um, 
uh, they wrote a song, did they, about uh, <laughs> about, about the uh, uh, which was which included the uh, the Morden line: "The rich get richer and the poor get children." Yes. And we got and we got the song was the title. And I, I submit to you, Richard, they don't write tunes about recessions. So there, I rest my case. The, you know, I, I I remember the song in the book and and enjoyed that. I, there's a lot to talk about here. You, you've mentioned the Federal Reserve. Uh, we've also mentioned uh, briefly what 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 sort of precedes and and causes the problems. Um, uh, I want to ask you. Why does the experience of 1921 not translate eight years later? And, and I know there, there's a lot there. Uh, my, my, my sort of thinking is it's actually the rise of uh, just the, this, the notion of just democracy itself won't let this sort of pain uh, and this, this, the suffering that does happen. Uh, and you note several instances of this very heartbreaking things that, that happened um, that people were talking about. But it's almost as if... It's almost as if, yes, uh, the, the proper policy tools were applied uh, from a free market standpoint, and yet we can't handle the deprivation. And so, in a way, you won a battle, but you lost a larger war. Well, what happened in the 1920s um, to cut short the Depression was the... Uh, let me try, sorry, what, what, what cut short that Depression, 1920, 2021, uh, was the... Uh, the uh, were the adjustments that uh, free markets affected both in the prices of products and in the wages of labor. Uh, wage rates came down, uh, not as not so fast as prices, but they came down. And as wage rates fell um, and as costs fell, profit margins were gradually restored. Things got cheap. Both um, merchandise and labor became cheap and therefore attractive. Entrepreneurs uh, began to buy and the inventory cycle turned and lo and behold, there was a rapid recovery. Um, in 1929, Herbert Hoover was in the White House. He had been uh, Harding Secretary of Commerce. In 1929, as president, um, Hoover did everything he could to forestall the adjustment of wage rates to falling prices. He convened a big splashy conference of America's industrialists and uh, everyone resolved not to cut wages. And uh, the case can be made. In fact, the case is made very well, and I think persuasively by an economist named Lee Ohanian, that it was Hoover's drive to uh, to prevent any wage adjustment that turned what might have been a severe recession in 1929 into the protracted and devastating depression that it became. Now, um, uh, I submit to you that, uh, that what made the 1920-21 depression truly great was, although difficult, was that it did not, did not go on and on. It, it ended uh, in, 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 in pretty good time, and, and the uh, contrast, the 1929-33 experience. Uh, so which one was the more humane? I, I submit to you that the 1920-21 yeah. experience was far the more humane. Yeah, I, I want to talk briefly. You, 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 the gold standard is a huge part of uh, your book and is also obviously part of the events. Um, and I just, I just wanted to ask you, uh, the gold standard this time and the discipline it imposes on governments and international competition that it seems to foster uh, uh, almost, you know, un, you know, unintentionally almost, but just sort of everyone is adjusting around uh, their fear of losing gold or, or receiving an inflow or something. So I just, how does that work in this process? Well, the gold standard... Um uh, uh, fixes the value of money as a weight or as a measure. Uh, dollar was defined as a certain weight of gold. You know, one ounce got you twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents. And uh, it, it fell to uh, people in the economy to adjust to uh, changes in, in prices, but the, the value of money did not adjust. Um, what happens today is that the Fed does its best to change the value of money rather than forcing adjustments in the markets for labor and uh, for merchandise. Um, the gold standard uh, uh, was simply um, uh, uh, a device that, uh, uh, that, uh, that well, it, it works as, as it was a pure simplicity in the way it worked. You uh, were uh, invited to exchange your paper dollars for gold at the, at the, at the statutory rate. You could do the opposite. Uh, gold entered and left the country freely. Um, and uh, you know there was no there was no monetary policy, not much of a monetary policy to speak of beyond that. 
But the, the gold standard itself is uh, the discipline uh, on governments is what, you know, policymakers reject uh, moving forward. And there's also the idea of central banking that you talk about in the book, or kind of the, the ideology of macroeconomics and that somehow we can dispense with that discipline and be able to do a lot of new things and not worry about balance of payments problems, not worry necessarily, or oh, we actually, we, we don't, we're not even really that concerned with inflation, all these sorts of effects uh, that you know, we, can't, we can't achieve uh, if we're under the standard. So I, mean, I guess that's also a part of what's, what's going to change uh, over, over the course of the 1920s in the minds of a lot of leading economists and policymakers. Yes, once, once you get out of the, um, into the mid and late 1920s, central banking becomes a much different proposition. It becomes now a, kind of an actively managed affair. Uh, central bankers seek to, um, by, by, by way of uh, open market operations, meaning the buying and selling of government bonds, the central bankers try to uh, 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 affect stability of prices rather than let prices uh, 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 rise or 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 fall, and um, that's a very large topic. But you yeah. can make the case, and I think I I try to make the case that uh, the the stability that uh, the central bankers imparted in the mid and late 1920s was an artificial one. I mean, really, in a time of technological progress, uh, why shouldn't prices fall if the cost of making things fall? Um, uh, the central bankers are against that. Consumers seem to be for it. Americans spent most of the weekend seemingly looking for bargains. Uh, uh, but when central bankers intervened to forestall what might have been a natural decline, a wholesome and natural decline in prices, you get distortions in the economy, and those distortions uh, come to full view in the subsequent business down- cycle downturn. On uh, criticisms of, of this period uh, in, a, in the Federal Reserve's role, uh, Alan Meltzer, you quote in the book, uh, says the policy failed in 1920, 1921. So, uh, so did Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz and, and their monetary history well, the, book. The, 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 the policy failed, but the patient lived. <laughs> the pol- Why do you think they came to those judgments? I mean, those are two big authorities. Uh, in well, they, I, I think they're, they're both. They're, 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 they are pointing to what seems to be a boneheaded error. Prices um, of commodities of all kinds, uh, and indeed prices of finished merchandise, just fell out of bed beginning in the spring of 1920. It started, this cascade of falling prices began in the silk market in, in Japan, and it engulfed the world. And, and uh, you know, farmers watched the price of cotton collapse, of wheat, of corn, uh, industrial products likewise, uh, and there was a, a terrific undertow okay. of deflation. And in the face of this, the Federal Reserve actually raised um, its policy interest rate uh, to about 8% at the, at, the, at the peak. And when prices are falling, an 8% interest rate looks like the Himalayas. Um, uh, and some people at the time um, beseeched the Fed to please, would you please, they said to them, would you please read the papers and notice that this country is suffering under under this, in this this rack you have put it in of very high. So I, that, that was the case against the Fed. I think what the this anomalously, perhaps cruelly high interest rate did was to accelerate the adjustment that had that uh, people made. Um, you know, uh, it sped up the process of of adjustment such that the depression was more severe, perhaps than it might have been otherwise. It ended uh, more quickly. Uh, the authorities on monetary history, that is the ones you quoted, uh, call this a failure. Um, many people holding that opinion would call the present experience of monetary yeah. policy a success. We have been five or six years since the bottom of the cycle, and still there is no dynamism to speak of in American enterprise. And um, you, you pick your poison for me. I'd take something short and, and unsweet and painful if it were to give way to something long-lived and dynamic and prosperous, but uh, to, to a degree, all these are political judgments. Yeah, I, I mean, this kind of brings us to the role of the Fed. Uh, so the Fed sets the interest rate at 6% and then at 7%. Is, is the claim that uh, that rate was too high, or how did they come to the judgment of, of 6% and then 7%? You have to recall that... Um, that the Fed was looking at um, a terrific inflation, inflation induced okay. by government yeah, yeah. Uh, financing during World War I. Uh, prices were going up as then measured. 
in the low to uh, mid-teens for several years running. Um, after every war in American history, uh, uh, prices had collapsed. There, a, 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 dep a depression had invariably followed um, uh, a major war, not so in the case of World War I. So in 1919, anomalously, the, the prices kept going up and the Fed felt it had to do something. After the Treasury freed it from its wartime obligations of financing, uh, government spending, the, the Fed began to raise rates and it also had to worry about the amount of gold that the various reserve banks held. Uh, there was a rule uh, about how much gold you had to hold in relation to the outstanding volume of, of paper currency. So these various considerations uh, drove okay. the Fed to uh, raise interest rates. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, at, at this time is um, a much more decentralized uh, body, a uh, much more decentralized bank uh, than we have now. And uh, the way that and also there was no mandate for prices and no mandate uh, for employment. So it, it actually is, is this an instance where the Fed one worked as intended um, or was it, or is it something else? Uh, or I guess you know something builds on it is that the Federal Reserve is actually seen as a as a tremendous policy tool, uh, and and will be indispensable going forward, and and what it does, and will gain power, uh, yeah. and these sorts of situations occur. Well, the, the, the Fed was established to uh, furnish uh, uh, what the financiers call liquidity during times of stress. Typically, there was a period of banking stringency in the autumn when crops were financed and were transported from um, the interior of the country to the seacoast. Uh, people wanted to borrow money for that. Uh, uh, interest rates went up, and they thought, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if there were a decentralized central bank to uh, to lend against uh, sound collateral and to iron out these um, all too recurrent cycles in financial stringency? That was the thinking. Nothing about uh, price stability. Nothing about uh, uh, employment certainly, or the macro economy, which phrase did not really exist. Um, and the Fed did, in fact, lend against eligible collateral and um, and did uh, come to uh, ease uh, the stringency of the money market in 1919 and 1920. It lent, albeit at high rates, but it did lend. And uh, there were very few bank failures, uh, very few failures of large banks in this period. The banking system came through with, really with flying colors. There were close calls, but uh, no great failures in, in distinction. Uh, certainly uh, very, a very favorable experience compared to what we saw in 2008. So the Federal Reserve, though, um Loses, uh, loses, or I guess the the sort of decentralized structure uh, over time, uh, and now is able to do. I mean, I guess that's really the, uh, another question that kind of looms in our mind is: it's given this independence, but it's given the independence. I I take it to do things like uh, initially to do things, to take positions that it took in 1920. Uh, now the independence itself is a source of great uh, great woe and allows kind of the, the opposite of 1920, uh, which is our, our current disaster to unfold. And, you know, for it now to almost become something like, as I recently heard a critic say, it's a sovereign wealth fund almost. Well, the Federal Reserve has conflated uh, central banking with a, a kind of a seat of the pants central banking. Uh, central, central plan, I'm sorry, it's conflated central banking and central planning. Central plan, yeah. We have uh, kind of elided from the gold standard over the course of the decades to a kind of a Ph.D. standard. Uh, this former tenured economics faculty uh, r runs the monetary, monetary policy of the country with a great deal of discretion. And the Fed has, uh, has overridden uh, the price mechanism, uh, what we call the price mechanism, meaning the free play of market forces, certainly in the, uh, in the financial markets. Um, interest rates are kind of government-issued prices now. It's a species of price control. Uh, the Fed has, uh, uh, has, uh, has used its power as both a persuasion and a main financial force to lift up uh, real estate and stock and bond prices. Uh, so you wonder if there's a straight man in the house if you work on Wall Street. Uh, the markets are, are very much under the federal thumb, yeah. and nothing could have been farther from uh, people's imaginings in 1920 and what the Fed has become. Uh, you make the point uh, in the book, the board of, uh, of directors of the Federal Reserve at this time, uh, or, or yeah, board of, or board of governors, I'm sorry, they actually are businessmen. Uh, 
uh, for the most part. Uh, then there's really only one, I think, who's an academic economist, if I remember correctly. Uh, you find that insightful, you find that meaningful in the sense that they don't perceive themselves to have all of the answers uh, or to have some sort of macroeconomic uh, you know, approach that uh, could actually solve the country's ills. Yeah, they, they, uh, and, they, and they spoke English for the most part, yeah. um, uh, which I think was a, a helpful thing. Um, they, you know, they, they had no greater capacity for clairvoyance than do the academics today who run monetary policy. The difference is that the academics uh, very dangerously believe in theories and in econometric models. And um, one is reminded of, of William F. Buckley's line about he would rather be governed, was it by the first yeah. 200 names in the tell, yeah. Boston phone directory than by the Harvard faculty? What we have today at the Fed is, is kind of the Harvard faculty. Some of it comes from Berkeley and some of it comes from other institutions, but this is a basically an elite academic um, uh, monetary Mandarin regime and um, uh, with all the trimmings and with all the consequences. You have, there, there's a quotation here I want to read to you and, and get your reaction on because it it sparked in my mind, I mean, if, if we think about what preceded uh, this depression, it truly was something new in American life in the sense of the war socialism uh, that we were under in World War I, uh, the tremendous amounts of power, censorship, uh, conscription to fight the war, uh, all, I mean, all sorts of big government uh, interventions and actions uh, around the administration of Woodrow Wilson. You quote him uh, on page 62 in 1919. He says, quote, I am perfectly sure that the state has got to control everything that everybody needs and uses. Uh, and then he says his successor must be a man who reflects long and deeply on these complicated relationships. It is something of an achievement in 1920 uh, that larger government intervention is in pursuit, even though there, there is a, you know, a fairly conservative Republican in the White House, Warren Harding. Uh, and yet this sort of restraint uh, to me seems uh, significant, especially given uh, what we've just Experience. I mean, we are kind of being prepped uh, for well, this sort of, of stuff. Part of, restra- so part of the restraint was medical. I mean, um, as you recall, Herbert, uh, sorry, uh, Woodrow Wilson um, got in a train yes. and undertook a tour of the Western states to uh, make a personal plea for implementation of the of the uh, treaty in the League of Nations. And, um, and during that uh, uh, train ride, he uh, suffered a stroke and was incapacitated, and so was his administration. So this was laissez-faire you know, by uh, by accident. Wilson certainly would have been, I think, more inclined to intervene um, had he been able and, and um, yeah. had capacity for mischief. But he was laid low, and so was his administration. Then comes uh, Warren Harding. And, and the, the difference between – one of the differences between the present day and, and that distant day is that uh, Republicans gathered in their convention in 1920. Uh, the economy was certainly weakening um, – though not so weak as it would become in a few months, but it was plainly not well. And the only reference to economy in the Republican platform was the word as it applied to economy and government. They wanted a balanced budget. And by the way, so did the Democrats uh, insist that the budget had to be balanced. But uh, uh, it, you're right, it was it, it, the, the, the difference between the war socialism of 1917-18 and the uh, laissez-faire regime of 1920-21 is, is quite a contrast. Uh, I, I guess also it, it seems interesting. We're already seeing the debate happen, uh, which shouldn't be surprising, uh, amongst uh, those driving Fed policy. It, it, you you kind of spend a chapter going through the uh, sort of a, kind of a letter debate uh, amongst these men and uh, the, the idea being presented that um, more should be done and uh, that this policy is actually backfiring. And Benjamin Strong, you, know, you report he really holds the line uh, against this sort of thinking, but you know already. Then also John Maynard Keynes uh, weighed in as well uh, that the policy was failing. So we already see, I guess, the disgruntlement or the, or the desire to push beyond this discipline uh, that the Fed is trying to maintain. Yeah, well, this was the uh, last governmentally unmedicated yeah. business cycle downturn in American history, and you can in, indeed, just as you say, you can see the liniments of, uh, of what was to come in the in the discussion and the and the all well intended. And uh, certainly, um, empathetic, certainly empathetic response to some people like uh, John Skelton Williams, who was then the controller of the currency and an ex officio member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. He wanted the Fed to do something to relieve the uh, the suffering of the people that his bank examiners had, uh, you know, confronted face to face. 
You know, but the, but the what pre, you know what not only precedes a depression, but what also is instrumental in causing a depression are the uh, is the uh, is the distortions wrought by inflation and and by and by boom times. And uh, there had been a great and distorting wartime boom. People had made the wrong decisions. They had been given the wrong incentives through the structure of inflated interest rates and, and prices, and, and they you know, built the wrong kind of factories or too many headquarters buildings. Or in the yeah. case of Harry S. Truman, they opened up a haberdashery in Kansas City when perhaps not one more haberdasher was needed. And um, and so the, what what the job of the Depression is to uh, is to recognize and reprice error. And uh, uh, nobody's going to raise his hands and volunteer to be the first one to do that, and no one likes to do it, um, even after others lead the way. But um, without the recognition and the repricing of error, you are left with uh, uh, with uh, stasis. You are left with a kind of a Japanese sleepwalk. And one of the fine things about um, American life is that um, is that uh, we don't really uh, find much shame in, in, in failure. If, if an entrepreneur wants to try again, we wish him well, wish her well, and it's off to the, off to the next thing. And uh, that was the case in the 20s. There was plenty of failure. There was plenty of suffering, and people collected themselves, and, and lo and behold, uh, prices adjusted and wages adjusted, and boom, the 20s roared. How do you see the criticism? So, uh, just thinking of, of of these roaring twenties and kind of our historiography. So, we don't even really think much or hear much about uh, the Forgotten Depression that that your book is about. But yet, what we all know is that somehow this boom period of the nineteen twenties was fake. That, that seems to be kind of the popular view uh, and one that's presented frequently in terms of criticisms preceding the Great Depression of nineteen twenty nine. Um, and yet, your account, I mean, it kind of helps us understand why that would not have been fake, because quite frankly, prices have been cleared out. Businesses had failed. Uh, you know, we, we were ready to go again, to move forward again economically. Well, um, you, you, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were things in the 20s that, uh, that, that uh, uh, free market people objected to. Uh, there, you know, uh, uh, the, the Fed in 1927 undertook to uh, stimulate through a uh, perhaps a, a below market discount rate. It did this in cahoots with the Bank of England. There was were examples of uh, similar examples of uh, of, uh, of financial malpractice elsewhere. Um, but you know, when when you have a a run of seven or eight years of of high prosperity, that's that's no small thing in the history of the world. Yeah. And uh, uh, certainly, the you know what happened later. Uh, was a great blot in the history of the world, but uh, one wonders again whether the 1929-33 experience was uh, was God's vengeance on on uh, on the so-called fake boom, or whether it was itself an instance of misplaced government policy. Uh, this comes comes back to whether Herbert Hoover was. Uh, was an enlightened modernist in trying to forestall wage declines, or whether he was merely bungling um, uh, the market's otherwise, uh, um, you know, synchronous adjustment. Yeah, the engineer uh, was at work on uh, 1929, and that, that moment of you know, you talk a lot about Hoover uh, and and what he did there as as kind of the opposite in, in terms of um, you know setting this or not preventing wages to fall. It's almost itself. It's not even economic debate. It's really uh, almost sort of special interests uh, and sense of using government, both sides, union and um, leading industrialists, come together and meet at the White House. Uh, and and Hoover sets this agreement to not let wages fall, and it's almost, in a way, it's a uh, and and of course, the, and, and, the, and the other side is wages aren't going to go up either. No, the unions won't demand wage increases, so it's almost in a way we're seeing, we're seeing democracy play out. We're seeing um, uh, government interventions playing out uh, in that in that respect. And and again, this goes back to I guess the lack of discipline uh, that that's there. That's not uh, that that is there in 1920 with the gold standard. Um, yeah, I mean, concerning Hoover, I, I think he was a, a, a very um, a substantial and admirable human being. He was, of course, a successful mining engineer. He yeah, was uh, yeah. um, a philanthropist of, of uh, uh, not only great empathy, but of also great achievement. Um, and he, he wanted to do well, and he wanted to use the government to affect good outcomes. And in 1921, it was he who who pushed Harding into convening a, uh, 
an unemployment conference. He wanted the government somehow to relieve the suffering of people who couldn't find work, well intended as, as were his actions in 1929, 1930, and 1931. But, uh, you know, the... Uh, there is something also wonderful about the silent workings of the invisible hand, uh, much mocked by the left. But, um, you know, compare and contrast 1920, 21, and 1929, 33, and the 30s beyond that. Um, I submit to you again that um, nothing is quite so humane as uh, an adjustment that is uh, uh, short rather than prolonged. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I guess one one question is, how do you see um, macroeconomic thinking uh, developing in the 1920s and reaching macroeconomic the Depression? Macro econ- yeah. Go ahead. Macroeconomics, yeah. Richard, is politics um, tricked out in differential calculus, in my opinion. I think that, that, the, <laughs> that macroeconomics is a kind of a black art. Uh, the idea of managing, uh, the idea of aggregate demand, the idea of managing such a thing, the idea of of measuring uh, the overall macro economy, all these things are relatively um, are relatively new under the sun. Um, uh, I, my hero with respect to the anti macroeconomic ideas, is a fellow named Copperthwaite, who was the uh, financial secretary of the then colony of Hong Kong. 1961 to 71 or thereabouts, and uh, um, uh, Copperthwaite, on principle, refused to allow economic data to be collected, lest somebody in his government um, found use for that to manage things. He wanted a decentralized uh, administration of, of, of markets and of price discovery. Um, price discovery brought on through the interplay of supply and demand rather than the imposition of ideas from on high. So I'm, I'm some, I sometimes wonder whether there are are, are, are uh, preoccupation with uh, with these with these data and our intent yeah. upon managing them it does not do much more harm on balance than good. How does I mean, in thinking of uh, as we move through the 1920s the gold standard itself? Uh, how does the operation of that uh, sort of influence or change? Or well, the gold, it's, the it's a modified standard, gold standard, yeah, right? Gold, right. The gold standard, um, uh, the classical. Uh, version of it perished in the trenches in 1914, like so many other yes. things. Um, and what came out of the 1920s was, a, a, as you say, a, a much modified and much uh, reduced and diminished edition of the gold standard. It was called the gold exchange standard. And uh, it was uh, stripped, was this gold standard version stripped of its of its workings. You know, you the gold standard required uh, uh, adjustments and balance of payments. It required countries to... Um, not consume more than they produced, at least not for a long term. It uh, it held people to um, uh, account, and um, what the British wanted, what others wanted, was a kind of a, um, a friendlier, a little, uh, a, a gentler and softer version of the gold standard. You could run a deficit, uh, and you could uh, uh, instead of sending gold, you might send government securities, and um, your money might. Uh, actually be in two places at once if you worked it right and, and there's no none of these uh, uh, none of this pressure to uh, raise interest rates and to attract gold if you were finding yourself uncompetitive with, with respect to your industries so the, the the 1920s version of the gold standard was really a gold standard in name um, and uh, you know the, the it's so people who blame the 1929 uh, episode on the gold standard I think are are uh, slightly off base yeah, I, 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 one question. I mean, my my thinking is it's you know we've actually you know because of uh, you know really the the inability to you know I think largely to stand on principle because of you know, the, what what people are demanding and and grasping for and it's of having to placate large voting blocks that in itself it's it's the loss of that discipline uh, that that you know one needs uh, it, it seems to me at that time and you didn't have it. And and now we've got uh, you know the sense of uh, government trying to manage uh, its way out of the out of the mess. When you think about uh, what happened in two thousand nine, with the stimulus and you know uh, almost a, a nine hundred billion dollars or something was was pumped into the economy, that sort of thinking. It's almost as if um, we accept outright uh, the idea of of this Keynesian economics uh, thinking, uh, and yet the evidence 
comes back time and time again uh, that whatever it's doing, it's, it's not doing it that well. Of course, if you dump that much money in the economy, you're going to get some positive effect. But the cost and the inefficiencies are incredible. And yet, we can continue to do it again uh, and again. And I, I guess, what do you, do, you do, do you look at that and get depressed, or do you think it's, it's just lack of economic thinking? Well, um, uh, it might not be much of a world that we live in, but it's the only world we've got. I don't get depressed about it. I mean, I think people, yeah. um, uh, you know, what one must do, of course, is to come to terms with the rules um, of the game in the era in which one lives. Yeah. I myself, um, if there were uh, a little more uh, penicillin and uh, uh, some um, painless dental work available in 1920, I think that would be a swell time to have lived. You can... Yeah. You can uh, Watch prices fall and wages fall a little bit less, but still synchronize. And then you can observe at the bottom in the summer of 1921, you can observe the uh, price of Coca-Cola trading at uh, at about uh, five or six times earnings. And the RCA, Radio Corporation of America, trade for exactly per share what that company would earn in 1923. And uh, um, uh, being a fellow or a lady of, of great sense and of... Uh, of uh, with substantial savings because you were that far-sighted, you scoop these bargains up, and uh, and wouldn't that have been lovely? Well, we had something of that in 2009, but we what we mainly had was the government intent upon not allowing uh, uh, prices and wages to adjust as they perhaps ought to have done uh, to uh, to it to. Um, uh, get ready for a new cycle after the abuses of the preceding cycle, the abuses having to do principally with housing and housing finance and the resulting distortions in American balance sheets. So uh, you know, yeah. the rules today are that, um, yeah. uh, that what adjusts are uh, asset prices and interest rates, and what does not adjust, and sometimes exchange rates, what does not adjust, what must not adjust, they say, are prices and wages, hence the Fed's fixation on yeah. What they are pleased to call deflation. What they, what they they mean by deflation is a rate of debasement um, uh, that is not high enough. They want to, a debasement of two percent a year, and anything less they call deflation, which yep. is actually not deflation. Where do you see? I mean, just thinking um, ahead, how, how does the Fed even begin to unwind all of these mortgage purchases and uh, you know interventions in the market itself, and uh, the, the massive balance sheet it now has, and things like that? Do you see this? Is there a way for this to end well, uh, or does it, or or not? Well, um, if you had asked me this question about thirty or forty years ago, when I knew a great deal more about the future, yeah, I would have said there's no way this could end well, and. Um, what I will now say is that um, uh, if you allow that the Fed has been embarked on an exercise in price control, and if you allow from the historical evidence that price control literally has never worked satisfactorily, yeah. uh, then you are bound to say that there is no chance of this turning out well. But because, Richard, I have been around the block so many times, <laughs> I'm going to say there's a very small chance <laughs> of it working out well. Um, you know, America, American enterprise is uh, yeah. is like like a like industrial weeds. You know, you you can cut them back, but they'll they'll grow anyway, just out of spite. American enterprise is irrepressible. So uh, um, I'm thinking that the Fed will have a great deal of difficulty in unwinding what it's done in in somehow, um, as they say now, walking back the distortions that these artificially low interest rates have have uh, introduced into the whole structure of production and of finance. Uh, it will be with great difficulty that they somehow scrape out, uh, get, you know, escape from this this box they put themselves and us into. Uh, but um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying it's highly unlikely it will come about without uh, without some difficulty. Jim, I wanted to thank you so much for your time today. We've been talking with James Grant, uh, the author of The Forgotten Depression, 1921: The Crash That Cured Itself. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.